Well, we're taking a, a little trip away from the book of Acts today to talk to fathers uh, from the book of Psalms, this song that um, was written, a song of ascent. So if you open your Bible to Psalm 128, Psalm 128, and if you don't have a Bible, it's in... Uh, Open up your pew Bible there that's right there in front of you, and you can see um, the Word of God as it is um, opened up before you. And lots of different things to talk about when I think about talking to dads. I want to encourage you because you're here. Um, sometimes it seems that the, the people that uh, may need to hear a message, I remember in uh, Illinois, when um, we were, at my oldest son, who was actually born in December of 1984, and uh, when you guys were here at the church for the first time and uh, the church voted to take you on, um, and there was a concern in the community for uh, drugs were starting to become prevalent. And uh, so they had these meetings with parents concerning drugs and what needed to be known uh, uh, to battle this. And so we show up at a meeting and there's certain parents there and I may have shared this story before, but it was as I looked around the room, not that my kids would be ever a, not able to do something bad, okay? So it wasn't one of those things where I'm thinking, my kids could never do this um, because I know me, all right? And they got my blood. Um, but the, the reality is that um, I looked around that room and a lot of the people that needed to be there, they weren't at that thing. And so sometimes that's what you have. You have these meetings that, oh, we need to have a meeting and talk about this and the people that need to be at the meeting aren't at the meeting. And so sometimes as I'm sharing with you, there might, you might be sitting here going, you know, you're being kind of hard on us, just so you know, we're here, all right? There's a lot of pappies in the old sack back at home and not, uh, not hearing one thing here. So thank you for being here. But I think part of my job is to kind of coach, to encourage you the things that God's working on me about, uh, that he'd work on all of us about. So when you, ever you hear me and you start hearing me and I'm getting all worked up about something, put before that, Okay, he's talking to himself, too. It's a let's do this as opposed to you ought to do this. It's let's do this. And so as I was thinking, I was thinking about us as, as men. So I'm going to talk to dads, but wherever the, the principles transcend sexuality, women get in there, too. All right? So whenever there's something you're like, that applies to me, too, which most of it does. All right? do that so that you don't turn yourself, oh, it's a dad's message or it's a man's message. But I was thinking about, I don't know how many of you know what Twitter is. Some of you are like, Twitter. Twit. We called people, kids, twits <laughs> that were interesting in um, school back in the day. There is this thing called Twitter, which is another social media, and some of you are like, I hate this. Why do you talk about that? Well, it's a reality, all right? So welcome to 2012. There's this thing called Twitter, which is a social media thing, and there are things called tweets. Stay with me. <laughs> and what it is, is it's another opportunity for somebody to get out what they're doing. And some of it can be stupid. I just yawned. I know they'll be interested in that, you know, or whatever. And so you, you, you can send out, and so you send it out. It has to be in 140 characters, which is um, the amount of spaces that it can fill. So it has to be concise. And there's been times when I would send out a tweet, and it would be, um, it would be too long. And I don't know if you've ever noticed this, those of you that do writing, but to, to shorten something is actually difficult. Some of you are like, oh, I love it when I only have to do a speech for a minute. Well, as time goes by, if you work on speaking, you're told a minute, you're like, really? Whereas some of you are like, I would love that. Okay, so it's not necessarily your thing. Well, this, 
that, so 140 characters, and what it is is you can send out and other people can send out, and so there are there is this information that is going out. Some of it is pointless, some of it doesn't matter. I, um, I am on it because I want to communicate in this culture and be out there. And also what I found is it is something that... Um, the preachers that I look up to are using it, and they'll send quotes. Uh, Billy Graham's grandson has one, some of the best tweets that I've read that have encouraged my heart. Um, I'm not on it all the time, but when I do have opportunity to look at these, they are encouraging. There's other pastors that send things out, and so and I want to do that. I'm out with the young people, the young adults. I take a picture of them when we're over at Binkley this last Thursday, and then I send that out just thanking the Lord to be with them. And so I've got a picture attached to this comment so that if anybody else would, and here's what it's called, anybody else would follow me, that's what they call people on twi us twits. Um, they f you follow people. Are you still with me? Some of you are like, I will never do that. Amen. I am so proud of you. Okay. <laughs> but there are others that will. Okay. And so I follow um, a bunch of different people, but one person in particular that I follow is, can I see his picture here? Justin Bieber. Some of you are like, this is a Father's Day message. Why are you making me sick? All right. <laughs> but I follow him. He has actually, um, the, I believe right now, the most followers on Twitter. I know you're like, who cares? All right. But I'm just telling you, this is the reality. And what Justin Bieber will put out is things like, been waiting a long time to share this album with you. Thank you for the support. Means everything. Hashtag Canada. See, he's from Canada. And what I mean by hashtag, if you know what hashtag is, like the pound sign or it's like the tic-tac-toe sign. And then you put words after it and it's your way of saying, yeah. All right. So Canada, you know, because he's Canadian. So he wants to send that out. Some of you are like, oh, now I really like him. Um, and I could go on and on and follow down his tweets of the different, hey, have a great day. Love you. Wish I was your boyfriend. <laughs> so, and some of you are like, I like him. Why are you doing that? All right. But whatever the case, I'm following him. So you know I'm hurting, all right? But so the reality is, I, by the way, he's got a great voice. And the man can dance. So what? Anyway, so, so, so I follow him. And I'm aware of things, but if he put on here, if he said on here, my album is coming out, and by the way, with each album, you can buy a t-shirt, go do that today. I don't know if that's too many characters, but if he did that, I'm not going to go, Justin just told me, I've got to do this. And so I would rush over the store and do that. I'm not going to do that. I follow him, but I don't follow him. Are you with me? He's got millions of followers. People that, that would say, I know him, they know about him, but they don't know him. I believe in this, I just want to put this out to you men today, I believe that some of us as men... Follow Christ like millions of people are following Justin Bieber right now. He'll put out, talking about Christ, he puts out commandments, wisdom, understanding. He's, and, he, and Jesus is many times concise, many times. And he doesn't just tweet to us, he calls us as men to an amazing life. And if we're not careful, he could just become somebody that we are following, like people follow on Twitter. And Jesus says, he's not going to play that game. When he says, come and follow me, he's saying, come 
and follow me. I don't give suggestions. I don't give pithy little statements that you go, well, I, I might buy your album. I might buy your T-shirt. No. He says, come and follow me. So let's pray. And as men, let's ask the Lord to get serious about what is something actually very important um, to tweet about. Let's pray. Father, we ask you that today as we're looking into your word, that, Lord, we would be people that would take you seriously, that it wouldn't be just a passing fancy, that it wouldn't just be part of social media, that it wouldn't be just something that when we get to it, when it's convenient for us, we would do this, but we, that we would, God, see the ramifications of our behavior as dads, as grandparents, as men, and that it would impact lives, God, for your glory. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Some statistics that I found this week that are humbling, and I, and I think if we would follow Jesus, truly follow Jesus, men, I'm talking to the men right now, and take God seriously, whether single, married, divorced, whatever the case, if I would say, from here on out, God, I'm going to take you seriously, how it would impact lives. Look at, listen to some of these statistics. 90% Hear that out. 90%, if you don't know what percentages are, 90 out of 100 inmates in prison say they had no relationship with their father. 90%. I had heard a story a while back about there was a nun that was having a ministry in prisons, and she, she shows up and she has uh, cards, Mother's Day cards, and she's handing them out as a ministry to have guys fill out and send to their mom as a way of saying, Mom, I love you. I miss you. Thank you for trying. I'm here. Thank you for forgiving. Whatever. And she ran out. She ran out. So she said, and that's in May. So the next month, June comes, and it's Father's Day coming up, and this nun was like, I don't want this to happen again. So she orders above and beyond the amount of cards that were needed for Father's Day, and I think you probably know where I'm going. Very few takers. She had minimal amount of cards taken because there was no interest in, in a dad who had no relationship with them. 90% inmates in prison testify to having no relationship with their father. 44% of poverty, those stuck in poverty, are single mothers. They're willing to play around, they're willing to lay around, but they're not willing to stay around. These dads are um, not taking seriously their role. 63% of youth suicides are in fatherless homes. 90% of runaways are in fatherless homes. 85% of behavioral disorders are in fatherless homes. 80% of rapists are in, from fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts are from fatherless homes. Do you hear the numbers? Does it make us, and, and so that's why some of you may be sitting here and go, yeah, but we're here. We are, we are dads that are involved. We are the dads that are, are taking the time to be with God bless you and continue on. And also, not just for your children, but when you see others that don't have dad investing in their lives, I pray that you would take the, the, the next step to be an encouragement and come alongside um, in a healthy way to encourage those uh, where dad's missing out. I look at some of these homes and I think to myself, these children, they're beautiful. They're a joy to be with. 
and I hear about the relationship that they, ha they have with their father or no relationship at all, and I think what they are missing with this beautiful child, with this beautiful young man, young lady that is growing up. And I want to commend single moms this morning. Amen? I don't know how you do it, but God bless you. And I also want to um, commend you young people, you children, you young people that are in this situation. My dad was at my house, but many times he was absent. And I'm grateful that you get to church. And you get to church on your own sometimes. And you actually are the ones that say, I will show up. I want to say to you, God bless you. And be blessed. And Grace Bible Church, we want to be an encouragement uh, to you. So as we're looking through this and uh, as we work through this song together, I'd like you to, to think about the words, this song, that this is a song of a sense, and a song of a sense was Jewish pilgrims would sing this on their way up to Jerusalem on three annual occasions. Um, the feasts of unleavened bread and the feast of Pentecost and the feast of tabernacles. And so this was in their, their hits. This was their songs that as they were going down the road and they're heading toward Jerusalem, everyone knew these words. Isn't that cool? You think about that because there's times we were even talking just now about national anthems and how there are some countries that, you know, they, the Zumex mentioned the fact that in France, uh, the national anthem for France is being sung and the soccer players weren't singing it. And there was an uproar about that. And now they know it because it didn't go over too well, okay? This is one of their songs. This is the song of Israel as they're making their way. And everybody knows the words. Everybody, everybody understands it. They're, they're singing it out, okay, as they're making their way to Jerusalem. So take, keep that into mind that this is a song. And what's the beauty of songs is you remember them. Isn't that great? I mean, can you, you ever have that? It was so cool. Howard Shy told me about this thing. You ever hear of a thing called Shazam? And I'm not talking about Captain Marvel, okay? There's this app. It's free. An app is a thing that you can get on, a, on your smartphone, okay? I need a smartphone. Probably figure out why. Um, but what it is is Shazam is this app that you can load into your phone for free and the other day, I'm at the Cardinal game with John Davison, and we're sitting there, and a song comes over on the loudspeakers. And I've heard it so many times, but I don't know who sings it. I press Shazam. You push this button, and you hold it out, and the, the stereo is blaring it into it. And in seconds, it comes up, oh, Flo Rida. <laughs> which is spelled like Florida, only you split it in two, and then you sound real cool, all right? So, and I'm going, oh, I'm going to rush right out and buy this album. Um, no, so it was, I was like, this is so cool. It would be if they're walking down the way and they're singing this song. By the way, Howard Scheid told me about this. Pretty cool. Um, I was like, Howard, you're all cool. You probably follow Justin Bieber. Anyways, um, so I go, um, so I, I'm thinking if back in Jerusalem, if they had a Shazam, it, and they push the button and they, they're singing this song, Psalm one, oh, Psalm 128 would come up. It would be known. It would be in their database. It would be understood. It would be heard. It would make sense to them. And so they're hearing it over and over and over again. And there's times where a song would come on the radio, and you'll hear it, and it's like all the words come rushing back. And that's the beauty what God does with his scripture here, is this song uh, has words here that, okay, this makes sense. And as a result, they'd hear it over and over. If we're not careful... What we can do with, the, with songs, and this is why you'll see constantly Don is up here and he goes, hey, I don't want you to sing, bear with the word, ignorantly. I want you to sing with knowledge. And so you have an understanding of what this, what are we singing? Because we can sing hymn after hymn, song after song, and not think about what we're singing. They're singing this, and it has something to say to dads. 
So let's look at this. First point today, because we're, we're thinking, okay, I want to be a follower of Christ. Not like the world follows Twitter, but a follower of Christ. And so number one, character gets followed. You want to have impact, men? Let's be men of character. Let's be men of our word. Let's be men when, when man, you actually believe God. It's not just mom believes God. You believe God. It's not just mom is dragging me to church, but dad is making the effort. It's not just mom is interested in studying the Bible, and mom is godly, and mom is this, but dad actually, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. No matter, and, I'll, and today will be the day I start if you're not doing it. Because character gets followed. Look at this, first verse here. After the, the, um, the prologue there, a song of ascents, it says, Blessed or happy is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. This who fears the Lord, it's a, a good working definition is provided by the parallel line, who walks in his way. What does it look like to fear the Lord, respect the Lord? I walk in his ways. God, that's what God wants me to do? I'm doing it. Because what daddy does, we do. I could say, I, I wish that wasn't the case, or I wish it was the case. Yesterday at the men's prayer breakfast, we're getting together, and, and we're talking about different things. And the thing that came to my mind uh, to, to ask these guys, and I love just talking with these men and, and the wisdom that they share, and something that I asked them, I said, what is it that your dad did or was like that you do and you are like? What traits did dad have that you see I have and it could be positive and it can be negative you ever have that man you look in the mirror and you go oh I'm starting to look like him <laughs> you know something my dad did a lot and I told this to the men yesterday my dad did the same jokes like all the time <laughs> like he repeated them all the time and what was so weird to me is everybody would always laugh and I'd watch this and I'd go, and what I figured out was he told the same joke to different people. I was just stuck with him every time. So every time he'd say this joke and I'm going, and I'd almost could lip sync the, the punchline, you know, that sort of thing. He'd say it and, he'd, <laughs> and I'm going, it ain't that funny. I've heard this like a thousand times. Guess what? I do this. And some of you are sitting there and you go, we know. I got his hairline. <laughs> You're like, there is no hair. Okay, that's the horseshoe head. You know, that, I got it from my dad, all right? I could go on, and, and the, there's negative things that I see that my dad did that my heart, I'm like, oh, Father, I, I don't want to do that. And some of the men, as they were sharing, it was so cool because they go, my dad was this, and it was negative things. But they said, and there was a certain point I determined, I'm not going to do that. And some people, oh, that may be a pride thing. But whatever it takes, if it takes that to spur somebody on, hopefully you have a better, better attitude concerning your father. But whatever the case, if there was something that dad did that he should not have done, that at some point you break the cycle. Because there are some guys, and I still I come across guys, they're still blaming their dad for how they're acting. They're still a victim. And they reach a certain age, you know what? Grow up. Yeah. Now you are responsible. Because if you know it's wrong, stop doing it. I'm sorry your dad didn't throw a baseball with you. My dad didn't either. I did it. Okay? But there's, and there's other things. My dad didn't do this. We get it. Your dad was Genghis Khan. All right? But forgive and move on. And determine in your heart, I'm not going to make excuses anymore. I, God, I want to be a man of character. 
And if there's an older gentleman that you're looking at and you're going, man, they, and, and by the way, the older men that walk with God, they admit, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, okay? But if you're, there's some of you look at and you respect them. I don't, I don't know how they would be offended by this, but you know, hey, I've been watching you. I just sense something. I've been praying about this. I need somebody to mentor me. Would you be willing to do that? And they might be going, man, nobody's ever asked me to do that. But you learn together. And a lot of it is just what's God done in your life. It's just so cool. Don't, don't wait for a church program to set that thing up. Oh, we've got to have this. You know what? You know your heart. You know what you need. And by the way, ladies, that's kind of a good thing for you too, for an older lady. And older ladies, get ready. Somebody might floor you. You know, this, this verse here may have been the basis for Jesus' illustration of the two builders. Look at Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. What's, men, what's your basement looking like? What's your foundation looking like? Let's ask God to make us men of character. Look at verse 2 of Psalm 128. He says, You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. The labor of your hands, the quiet, peaceful life of a thriving, prosperous workman in the country with no fear that the harvest will be trodden down by the invader before it is ripe, or the cattle swept off by some roving predatory tribe. The opposite is threatened as a curse in the law. Leviticus 26, 14 through 16. But if you will not listen to me and will not do all these commandments, if you spurn my statutes and if your soul abhors my rules so that you will not do all my commandments but break my covenant, then I will do this to you. I will visit you with panic, with wasting disease and fever that consume the eyes and make the heart ache, and you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. He's saying, he's saying, and this is under the law, this is to Israel. We understand uh, this is a covenant with Israel. Uh, the Mosaic covenant was one of conditional. You do this, this will happen. If you do this, this will happen. Good blessing, bad curse. And I understand we live in the age of grace, but you do know that there are principles here that, that do still stand. Because in, in the age of grace, in the book of Galatians, it says, in the letter of Galatians, he goes, do you not know? It's, it's what you sow, you reap. And the beauty of that verse, because sometimes they're like, oh, man, because some people, they're sowing bad stuff, and then on the weekend, they're praying for, you know, crop failure. But the beauty of it is this. If I sow what Christ has called me to, what grows out of that? Because sometimes we just make it a sin thing. If I do this bad thing, oh, it's just heavy. But God's saying, what are you investing in? What are you putting in? Look at the contrast here, Isaiah 3, 10 and 11. Tell the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their deeds. Woe to the wicked, it shall be ill with them, for what his hands have dealt out shall be done to him. God is constantly, he's doing this as a warning, and it's a warning out of love. He's tapping on the shoulders of men. What are your priorities? Who are you following? Do you say you follow me? So character gets followed. Secondly, point number two, strength gets followed. Look at the first part of verse 3. He says, Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. It's within your house. The, the woman's apartment says, marking the proper sphere of the wife engaged in her domestic duties. Remember the context or the culture that this is written in. And also to some extent her seclusion, though this was far less among the Jews than among, and this, this writer writes, other Orientals. 
This word vine, an emblem chiefly of fruitfulness, but also of gratefulness and dependence as needing support. And if you could look at this for a moment and, and see the word pictures that he's using, because he doesn't use things in vain. When he uses these agricultural pictures, he's using it metaphorically to teach something. As, as he'll use, as the, in the word, uh, Paul would use athletic metaphors. He uses them for a reason. So this vineyard, this vine idea, let me read it again. Verse, verse 3, first part there. Your wife... He says, "If you blesses the man who fears the Lord, so if I'm walking in his ways, I'm happy. This is going to be the, the results that happen out of it. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. If I'm walking with God the way I ought, it, it has ramifications for how I am treating my wife, how I am treating my daughter, how I'm treating women. And if you could see the picture there, um, growing up in Chicago, there wasn't a lot of um, vineyards around when I'm, but something that I do remember um, on some of the houses, some of the apartments in the city, there were these houses that had vines that would just cover the house. It was green. It was like that ivy and Wrigley where it just, it covers it and it would go around the windows and it would just attach itself to that. I was thinking, whoa, what a, it was, it was beautiful in some ways. And I, and I see the picture here and he's saying that this, this vine wants to thrive and it wants to thrive attached to something strong enough to hold it up. The times when, I've, when we drive through Missouri and, and you see those vineyards, the beauty of it, they are attached to something holding them up. And God is saying to us as men, what are you strong in? Because some of us, strength is important. Some of you, boy, you're strong. You can lift weights and, and you see these people that are athletic and they've got this strength physically, but then when you get to their character, there's nothing there. And God is saying, I want you to have character. Blessed is a man who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. And then you have strength enough so that as, as your wife wants to blossom, as she wants to be fruitful, attached to you and she, out of your strength, the blessings come. That's what they're looking for. I, 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 I've been just blessed by talking with these young ladies that are growing up in our church. And, and it's so funny because you have perceptions about this culture and, and you have these ideas that you go on these talks and something comes up in the Word and it's talking about a, a woman being submissive. And so I do the Bible study here with the... the um, the prayer meeting group, and as I'm heading over to the, the high school group, and I'm going, okay, i got to share the same truth with them. And what's so cool is that we've got a group of young people that they hear it and they receive it, and they realize women aren't weak. We know that they're not weak. I'm not having any babies. Thank you, Jesus. All right. But some of the things that these women go through physically, what they can handle, their, their ability to handle pain and stuff like that. But the Bible calls them a weaker vessel, and they are that, that china, that beautiful person that God's put in our life to respect and to cherish and to give Freedom to just become all that they can be, but still understanding that we're there as a support to them. Beautiful. And so as I'm sharing this with you, they're like, I want a guy like that. I'm sick of guys that think they're all that and, all, and there's nothing on the outside. But their character is like, hollow. Strength gets followed. And so from here on out, guys, if, if it hasn't been the case, and you might be, oh, I don't even want, I'm not going to come forward in an invitation. I just want to be that guy. We need each other. I'm surrounded by a bunch of guys that encourage me in my marriage, that encourage me in my walk with the Lord. 
thank God for them. So character gets followed and, and strength, get fo- strength gets followed. And lastly, point number three, farsightedness gets followed. If I would think for a moment here of the ramifications of my behavior, that, that I'm starting, and some of you guys aren't married yet. Some of you guys aren't married yet. But down the road, you're going to say, what kind of dad are you going to be? What kind of husband are you going to be? And you determine now. I'm telling you, that keeps you out of a lot of problems. I remember, I've shared this before with you. Josh McDowell, great apologist, great speaker. An apologist doesn't mean he was saying, I'm sorry all the time. Apologist means that he was a person that knew how to defend his faith. And he had this thing called, this, this tape. I remember this is back in the 70s. Okay? I'm like 11, 12 years old, listening to this tape, and it's called Maximum Dating, old cassette. I'm listening to Josh McDowell, and he tells me this line, and this had ramifications for me. It said this, treat every girl you date like you'd want your sister to be treated on a date. I never forgot that. Gold. That kept me out of so many problems, because I'm thinking, man, if I start making this move on this girl, I wouldn't want a guy doing this to my sister. I'm almost getting mad at me. I'll beat you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the end. I'm telling you, to, to, to allow God to impact you, to think like that, so that down the road, so that there be no regrets, so that when you go back to your high school reunion, you wouldn't have to go, yeah, I'm, I'm just sorry, I don't want to see her. But I can go back to my high school reunion. Most of them don't even remember me. Right? <laughs> so I got nothing to bring to the table, I guess. There you go. Thank God. The, look at the verses here. Second part. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Yesterday, because of this, I thought it only right that Kim and I had researched, and so we had to go to Olive Garden. <laughs> I didn't want to. I said, okay, honey. Just keep, keep bringing the breadsticks, that's all I'm saying. Breadsticks and butter, baby. Diet Coke, right there. All right, so. Now, I'm just doing research. It was for you. Not for me. So, anyways. But it said here is your, your children will be like olive shoots around the table. I want you to look at this olive tree. Got a picture here off of the internet. This next uh, click of the, yeah, look at that. Olive tree. That, that is just solid. And, and so it says your children are like olive shoots that are around. I don't know if you've ever seen that where at the base of your tree, sometimes you're having to, to uh, chop them down. But whatever this is shooting out, this, the shoots grow off of the main root of an olive tree to reproduce. The olive represented the vigorous, healthy, joyous life. You think about olive oil. The, when you're dipping your breadstick in there, you're, you, just, the, the, and the, just, the, the, just a beautiful taste and, the, and, the, and the, the abundance and how Israel, when, when they would read something like this, they, the olive trees are all over the place and they'd go, I want to be fruitful like this. I want to have an impact like this. And, and so to have the farsightedness to go, I want my children to rise up and call me blessed also, not just my wife. But when they think of dad, they go, he loved me and he loved God. And he loved me enough to have the hard conversation when I need it. And he earned the right to speak to me through moral authority. Verse 4, Behold, thus shall the man be blessed. He has to repeat it again. This happens in, in the Hebrew songs, in the, in the, the repetition here. Behold, behold thus shall the, the man be blessed who fears the Lord. Verse 5, the, the Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. It says, out of Zion, the dwelling place of God. Blessing flows from him. And, and what I see here, too, and this is a principle that you and I can have even in America. 
what I'm doing as a dad has national ramifications. The, how I'm raising my children and how I'm impacting young people outside of my home. Our country will be blessed by fathers taking their jobs seriously, by men doing that. And so I feel a calling, your pastor feels a calling, I, do, I care about girls. But I feel a special calling because I feel like a lot of times men are put aside or they don't take God seriously or they think, oh, church is just for girls. I'm going to do everything in my heart as I share to make them realize that this God thing is a man thing too. And not be embarrassed. So I'll come alongside these, these young men and some of them, they're wrestling with masculinity. They're, they're trying to figure themselves out. What is a man? What does a man look like? And so I'll play basketball with them, but at some point some conversations are going to come up and real life stuff comes up. Because I want the men in Warrington, the men in Warren County, these young men to know there is a place that they can come, that they're going to be loved, they're going to be respected, and then I'm going to challenge them. Challenge them, first of all, to receive Jesus Christ because none of this starts in their own strength. I, I need Jesus. So if you're ever wondering, why is, he, why is he so passionate about that? So I feel like if we can get some men, get a clue here, I think there'd be some women that would go, I like that. I'll follow that. Last verse, verse 6. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Look at some of these other verses in some other songs here and, and some poems of wisdom. Psalm 103, 17. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. God looks at ministry as long term. He isn't just about your kids. He's about your grandkids. Psalm 122. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Proverbs 13, 22. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. Proverbs 17, 6. Grandchildren are the crown of the aged, and the glory of children is their fathers. Isn't that cool? That's what he's called us to. This is what he's called us to. Lord, we'd ask you that we would uh, step out and be obedient.